delighted to welcome Andrew, who is a partner at uh, VWB and practices uh, in data protection and information law. I've heard Andrew speak before, uh, and he's um, very knowledgeable. And I know certainly um, it's good to just have a bit of an update after all the new legislation that we had to deal with. Was it last year? I'm trying to think when GDPR came out. The reg. Two years ago, time flies. Two years ago. My goodness, you see, the trauma hasn't left me. It felt just like last year. Um, but certainly, I think with all of us working uh, remotely or certainly more agilely, if that's the word, um, than we did um, um, prior to the pandemic, I think there's certainly some interesting um, things that it's worth uh, revisiting and also looking at anew. So, without further ado, um, over to you, Andrew. Thanks so much, Helen. So, um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about data protection with a particular focus on the issues that have and will continue to crop up in relation to COVID-19 and, and the pandemic. Um, in terms of what I'm going to cover, uh, the, hang on, my computer appears to have frozen, which is not a, not a good start. Oop, there we go. Sorry about that. So in terms of what we're going to cover, um, I'm just going to start off uh, just with a, a reminder uh, um, uh, regarding the key data protection principles and key compliance and risk areas. We'll then look into a bit more detail at how some of those principles and, and, and risks relate to COVID related issues. So we'll look at uh, using new technology and platforms such as Zoom, um, home working and re returning to the office. Um, using personal data for marketing and business development, how, how to go about doing that during COVID. And I'll then finish off uh, uh, by looking at issues around complaints, breaches, and, and other, other problem areas. So <clears throat> data protection is about uh, protecting people's rights in their information. Um, and as, as Helen mentioned, we've, we've had the, the GDPR has applied now for two years, so we're two years in. And Data protection law is for the most part made up of the GDPR, the Data Protection Act, which contains, um, uh, which sort of further sort of expands on and complements what's in the GDPR, and also the privacy regulations, which uh, uh, contain rules around electronic marketing. And I've set, I've set out on the slide here some of the key sort of data protection issues and risk areas. Um, whenever we're talking about data protection risks, I, I always think. Um, information security should sort of be at the absolute top of everyone's priority list. So, so not not that this, this would apply to anyone, but it's almost we're starting from scratch with regards to data protection compliance. Um, um, information security, I think, would be the first thing you would look at. And in fact, the vast majority of 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 um, fines from the ICO from the regulator have come about through um, through security breaches. <clears throat> so, in terms of what the uh, legislation says about security. Uh, it says you've got to put in place appropriate technical and organisational measures to safeguard personal data. So technical measures are things such as um, network security, um, uh, using encryption um, and so on. So your IT team should be heavily involved in, in, um, <coughs> um, um, in that side of things. And if you're sort of looking at um, uh, certification, whether that's ISO, um, for example, then then you know there is an overlap between um, uh, uh, the issues there and and data protection. But it's not just en not just enough to have a, um, a systems that are secure from a technical point of view. Uh, you also need to make sure that you've got processes in place um, um, around compliance. So, for example, making sure that your staff um, uh, and colleagues have been given training on data protection. Um, <clears throat> Uh, making sure that that's sort of backed up with um, uh, with written policies and procedures, and not not only will these steps sort of help uh, reduce the chances of something going wrong, but they will also count as a mitigating factor with the ICO should there be a data breach. For example, if someone makes a mistake, but the you, your business can point to a a policy um, uh, that you know that that that. Um, uh, uh, if someone did something in, in breach of the policy, then, then that would be a, a mitigating factor with the ICO because it would be evidence that we took steps to try and, and safeguard personal data. Um, it's particularly important to make sure that your sort of staff data protection policy is, is relevant and is specific to how sort of you and colleagues uh, use and handle personal data on, on a day-to-day -day basis. 
um, gone are the days when it was enough to have a policy that simply sort of listed or regurgitated the data protection principles. So you should be covering issues such as uh, the importance of data protection in the policy, uh, practical guidance on things like emails, um, uh, reminding people to, to, to double check emails, um, uh, uh, always sort of um, uh, being careful to share information outside of your practice or where you work and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so another sort of cornerstone of data protection compliance, uh, another key area uh, relates to, to transparency. So there, there are extensive transparency obligations under the GDPR. And in particular, um, you, you need to provide certain information to people about how you use their data. Uh, this is usually found in a document known as a privacy notice. And so you should at the least have a privacy notice uh, to cover staff and also an external notice um, for clients, um, um, prospects and anyone else you, um, um, uh, you come into contact with. Uh, the GDPR is also really, really big on documentation and accountability. So it's, it's, it's not just enough to be compliant, you've got to sort of document that compliance as well. And in, in broad terms, the, the, the requirements of, um, I suppose, formed into two categories. So there's the general obligation um, to sort of doc document compliance and to be accountable. But in addition to that, the GDPR mandates certain documents that you must have in place. Um, in addition to the privacy notices, um, that also includes um, what I call the Article 30 record, which is a record of your processing activities. Um, you've also got to have, um, uh, uh, most businesses will have to have uh, what's called an appropriate policy document, which, which sets out further information about how you handle so, so particularly sensitive or confidential information um, uh, uh, called special category data under, under the GDPR. Um, now it's interesting. The the um, uh, uh, the biggest risks I think um, are actually around not having the the policies that aren't um, uh, uh, explicitly required. So if you don't have an appropriate policy document, the the ICO probably wouldn't really be, be too fussed. They might sort of ask you to put one in place. But if you um, if you have a data breach and you you don't have a policy that provides guidance to staff on 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 compliance and the do's and don'ts. Um, the ICO will, as I mentioned, will see that as a significant aggravating factor, even though that policy isn't explicitly required under the legislation. So really it's about thinking about what documentation is relevant um, um, uh, to your practice, um, in addition to, 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 to dealing with the, the um, uh, to having the mandatory documentation in place. <coughs> another, bis, another big area, um, uh, a key, key area, uh, concerns data subject rights. So individuals have uh, a number of rights under, um, uh, under the GDPR. So they have a right to request a copy of their personal data. Uh, they have uh, uh, a right to ask you to um, uh, delete your data. Um, they have rights around rectification and, and so on. Um, most of these additional rights were introduced by the GDPR. The, um, the rights, the, the similar access rights have been around for an awful long time. Um, but it's interesting, the, the, the vast majority of the work that I do around data subject rights um, relates to social access requests rather than the other rights. So it seems that the, um, um, uh, most of the focus, most people are still really just interested in getting a copy of their personal data rather than sort of um, 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 a, a exercise, exercising all the other rights that they, that they now have under, under GDPR. So moving on then, so to look at some specific issues around um, uh, how we use and handle personal data and how they might relate to some of the new ways of working challenges brought in by, by COVID. Um, so um, since lockdown, we've all sort of been um, uh, uh, asked to uh, use uh, uh, new platforms, uh, for example, video conferencing such as Zoom, but, but we're also sort of doing, doing, doing more online as well. So um, uh, it might be that you're using a new sort of uh, e-disclosure software so that you can sort of disclose and redact documents electronically. Um, uh, I know that, that apps that um, enable clients to pay their fees um, uh, using their smartphones rather than calling up are, are popular as well. So we're using all this new kit, all these new platforms um, to sort of process and handle personal data 
about us, about our staff and, and our um, um, and our clients. And so what does the GDPR say we have to do? Well, to frame it in, in GDPR terms, the, the obligation, the, the, um, the provider of the platform, if, if they are sort of, if they're processing data on our behalf, they're going to be a data processor with, with your practice as the controller. And whenever someone engages a data processor, there are some three key things that they need to check. First of those is, is there a written contract in place that meets the minimum GDPR standards? So the, um, uh, the GDPR is very, very prescriptive in terms of what must be included in a contract between a controller and a processor. So it's important to check that those terms are in place. And the, the, typically the terms will be, will be drafted by the processor because it'll, be, you know, it'll be incorporated into their standard terms. And it's very, very rare, I, I've, I've found, to see a, a contract uh, produced by a processor, by a supplier, that actually contains all of the mandatory wording because the, the, the temptation has been too much of them to sort of to move away from the model wording in, in, in order to put them in, into a better place contractually. Um, uh, so it's important to, to check that and to check that, that the, the contract contains the minimum standards at, at least. Um, it's not sufficient to simply uh, have the sort of to sign the contract and forget about it. Um, there's also a requirement to carry out checks and due diligence on the processor as well to, to make sure that they are handling personal data in accordance with data protection uh, requirements or to, or to sort of say how, how, how it's expressed in the GDPR. You've, you've got to choose processors who, uh, um, uh, who provide sufficient guarantees with regards to compliance. <clears throat> and what those checks might look like and sort of how far you go, how far you, you drill down into it very much depends on, on what the process is doing. Um, so, but the sorts of things um, uh, you might be thinking about um, asking or checking is if they've got data, is that encrypted um, uh, to a, a, a decent uh, standard? Is the data encrypted during transit and at rest? <clears throat> Are they certified to a recognized information security standard? Um, how is the data sort of kept? How is it looked after in, in the data centers? What, what, what measures are, are in place there? And again, how far you go, it very much depends on what they're doing. So if, if you're using a, a video a conferencing platform, for example, <clears throat> um, and the only information that, that might sort of um, uh, be processed through that are sort of um, uh, uh, names and contact details of staff, then clearly the risks there are lower than say compared to if you're, if you're using a new uh, CRM system um, uh, that you, you're going to use to store sort of um, uh, extensive and sensitive client data. <clears throat> so the, the third thing to check is this. So if, if personal data is transferred outside of the UK or the EEA, then you've got to take an extra step for compliance. So if, for example, one of your processors is storing personal data on servers held in the, uh, uh, in the USA, um, unless the destination country has a finding of adequacy, which most don't, um, you, you can only uh, transfer the data if there is a safeguard in place. And the, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you would have seen on the news a couple of weeks ago, the European courts have found that Privacy Shield uh, is invalid. And Privacy Shield was, a, a, was essentially a self-certification scheme under which uh, uh, U.S. organisations would self-certify that they uh, uh, adhere to the GDPR principles, and and that then allow um, uh, businesses in the uh, uh, in Europe to to transfer personal data to them. Uh, but the courts have found that that privacy shield isn't valid. Um, the um, it seems the the best alternative one everyone's talking about is are the are the, are the uh, uh, model clauses, the uh, standard contractual clauses. So these are standard contractual clauses that the European Commission uh, uh, has produced, which um, uh, uh, which uh, count as a as a safeguard to allow to, to allow the data to be transferred outside of the um, and outside of Europe. And so many organisations are contracting on the standard clauses as an alternative to Privacy Shield. <clears throat> However, very unhelpfully, the judgment uh, at the court said that. It's no longer simply enough just sort of to, to, to sign the model clauses and then forget about it. 
um, uh, you still got to sort of to assess data protection compliance in the destination country. Um, and and it, it, it's um, uh, 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 it seems the the intention is you, you've got to sort of to assess things like the ability of um, uh, uh, law enforcement in destination country to to access the data that you're going to export um, uh, 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 that's being exported, which is you know um, completely impractical because uh, you know because how on earth you know, can a a a a business other than someone with huge resources sort of assess um, the you know the ability of the American state to access personal data and, and all, all the laws there. So um, I think a a pragmatic solution for the time being would, would just be to rely on the um, 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 the 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 model clauses and just see how things develop because there will inevitably be a set of guidance and and help from the regulators from the ICO in in due course. Um, the other thing to think about when when uh, using processes when when uh, using these sorts of platforms is around transparency. So coming back to the the privacy notice I mentioned at the start of the talk, um, you are required to give people information about the types of um, uh, uh, recipients that you share data with, and so for these purposes, all that means is just making sure that your privacy notice your privacy notices just list the different categories of platform that you use, so video conferencing, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I now want to move on and um, talk about some issues around homeworking and returning to the office. Um, just to sort of illustrate some of the points here, I, th I thought I would just sort of um, um, uh, put something into a, 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 a little mini case study. So this says, Dear HR, so I think I'm finally getting used to working from home. I've got a few questions, can you assist? I've been printing out documents from home, but I need to send them to my personal email account in order to print. Is there a better way? My internet connection is a bit ropey, so I'm having to save documents to my desktop or my personal laptop rather than using remote access. Is that okay? So I suppose my, my first comment here is that <clears throat> um, I'd be slightly concerned about getting this because this suggests either that the member of staff hasn't been listening or the the um, uh, the firm the hasn't been sort of been providing staff with guidance on on the do's and don'ts around homeworking. Um, uh, so it may suggest it may suggest that there is there is more work to do here. But to to look specifically at the two questions and and certainly. Printing out documents at home has been a you know it's a big uh, um, it's a big headache because you've got sort of issues around um, client confidentiality um, in addition to in addition to data protection concerns and the the risk here is that if this if if this individual is sort of emailing documents to their personal email account then you know potentially you've got some client information um, and personal data um, uh, held in a personal email account. Um, so um, in terms of options, I think it's important for, for every, um, every practice to take a view on, on what their policies are and to make sure that they are sort of um, uh, properly communicated and that they are sort of um, uh, um, enforced consistently. Um, <clears throat> and it might be that, that just, you know, thinking about pragmatism, um, uh, uh, it might be that, that, that some practices might decide that it is okay for staff to do a limited amount of printing, assuming they, they sort of remove any any client data and any personal data, which which reduces but not eliminates the risks. But clearly, there are some more practical steps that can be done here. Um, uh, for example, could the computer be configured such that it would just go straight to the printer, um, rather than sort of having to the the employer having to send something to their to their personal email account. Um, Again, that there may be a very, very sort of easy, easy sort of um, uh, uh, easy, easy solution to the, um, uh, uh, to, the to, to the second problem. Um, so, so maybe uh, the IT team, when it gets involved, for example, maybe it's just a Wi-Fi issue. So, so, so they should kind of just plug the computer in using a, a, an Ethernet cable. Um, they, they certainly shouldn't be saving in, uh, documents to their to their personal laptop. But if there really is a problem that can't be fixed, then I suppose one option would be to provide this, this individual, this employee, with a 
a work laptop that's been properly configured such that documents can be uh, uh, can be saved locally to, to the device without, without um, 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 in a in a secure way. Um, so I think it, it's, it's important to provide lots of practical guidance to staff on what they should and shouldn't be doing. Um, so, so that covers all sorts of issues, for example, printing, um, uh, keeping, keeping documents at home, uh, uh, keeping them under lock and key, making sure that family members uh, can't, see, um, uh, can't see what's happening, uh, just being alive to who might be listening in. Um, uh, one of them, um, uh, someone who lives on the same street as me a couple of days ago was, was having a very very loud conversation with the window open and I, and I could hear exactly what was being said you know so 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 you know it, it, it's important you know just sort of to make staff um alive to these um to these sorts of issues um and, and also to provide guidance around sort of um uh uh, uh making sure that if, if, if they're using their personal device for example uh uh, uh to remotely access work then um uh, providing guidance and making sure that the uh, the operating system is kept up to date, um, that uh, virus and, and anti firewall is um, um, are switched on as well. So there are plenty of practical points um, that that should be communicated to um, uh, uh, staff. Now, um, one option would be to, or rather, I, I certainly think that your uh, information security policy or data protection policy should be updated to. To include reference to, to, to these sorts of points, um, but I'd probably go a step further, and you know, and and there'd be no harm, you know, instead of having a a a, a home working uh, section on, on your internet that sort of clearly sets out the the, the guidance and expectations, and maybe even sort of having a, a newsletter that, that just reminds staff around um, um, around some of these um, um, some of these key points. So. Another issue that uh, sometimes crops up in relation to homeworking is uh, the extent to which um, staff are sort of monitored, uh, uh, either accidentally or, or, or deliberately. Um, so, if you if you are sort of um, uh, with any sort of platforms that you you ask staff to use, um, uh, uh, e.g., video conferencing, it's important just to sort of to assess um, the. Um, how it works in practice and to provide guidance to staff on, on any privacy issues. Um, for example, if, you've, if, if you ask staff to use uh, video conferencing that, um, uh, uh, that sort of tries to sort of ingest their personal um, uh, and private contacts and clearly that, that is a concern. Um, equally, uh, uh, some um, uh, a, you can get sort of functionality that will sort of monitor what staff are doing on their computer. And if, for example, they just sort of, um, uh, uh, if they're logging in, say, on their personal laptop using a remote desktop, if, you know, if they sort of move away from, from um, uh, uh, if they come out of their remote desktop or say, say, say check their emails, you know, if, 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 that, if that is logged, then, then you need to be transparent about that. And, and just, to, to just to make sure that staff are aware that that's, um, um, uh, that that's taking place. Um, another thing to think about is protecting staff and visitors uh, at the office. So as we sort of, as everyone starts to return to work, and and um, what we need to be thinking about. Um, so it might be, for example, that um, just to give an example. Um, I'm advising a client right now who sort of wants to sort of carry out. Um, what is effectively contact tracing on its own staff. Um, so, you know, if someone gets symptoms, they can quickly identify um, um, uh, who they've been in contact with. And so the sorts of things that we should be thinking about uh, in that example, and also more generally, is as I mentioned, we need to be transparent with, transparent with people so that, so that they understand um, uh, uh, why we're collecting the data and what data we're collecting. Uh, the GDPR, under GDPR, for any processing of data we do, we need to identify a lawful basis and so the, mo the most uh, uh, the most likely candidate here is legitimate interests. So so firms have a legitimate interest in um, uh, uh, instead of looking after the welfare the welfare of their staff and and um, uh, minimize, um, uh, uh, minimizing uh, uh, interruption to the business. Um, if someone uh, uh, if we're processing health information that counts as special category data. 
and so we should be thinking about um, uh, so we need to have a lawful condition for processing health data e.g the fact that someone has has has, has reported that they've that they've got COVID symptoms and there are various conditions contained in the uh, GDPR and the Data Protection Act um, uh, which might cover that so there is a condition that relates to processing that's necessary for employment and there are also some some specific health related um, uh, 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 conditions as well and we should also be thinking about compliance generally uh, for example how long are we, are we going to keep the data for um, uh, 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 making sure that we're not sort of using data um, uh, more broadly than intended so if we're sort of um, carrying out greater monitoring of who is in the office um, on any given day we need to make sure that we're not sort of starting to use that data for other purposes but for example you know to, to check that staff are coming into work on time um, in, in terms of transparency um, uh, there are various different ways that, that you, you can sort of communicate what happens so if you ask people to fill in the form then you might have some wording on that that, that explains what's happening uh, if, if you're sort of if you're collecting data about visitors to your offices for these sorts of purposes um, uh, maybe have a, a, a sort of a, a very clear statement uh, in reception or, or if visitors are asked to sign a form make sure that the the form contains the wording with which, which covers these points now and which explains how their data is used is going to be used and and so on okay so i now wanted to move on and talk a little bit about um uh, using personal data for uh marketing and business development purposes and obviously um, in light of, of, of the lockdown, it's now far, far harder to sort of to, to meet clients face to face and to have that sort of um, um, that interaction. And so we're sort of carrying out more sort of marketing at a distance, um, whether that's sort of by email um, uh, uh, or, or, or picking up the phone. Um, and uh, unhappily, there are there are sort of various different rules and and restrictions um, that. Uh, sort of limit how we might sort of contact people for for um, um for marketing purposes um and there are there also got a quite sort of you know a uh, uh, quite complex and there are lots of different exceptions so if um but the ico has just some helpful sort of uh, tables on its website that show what you sort of um when you consent and when you don't need consent and so on but just to give you a very brief overview you you if you want to sort of send a marketing uh, uh, by email uh, then you um, um, uh, you need to get opt-in consent um, uh, uh, subject to, to exceptions the the first of those um, is that uh, uh, if the email address is is that of a corporate um, uh, so if you send something to John Smith at HSBC for example uh, then there is um, uh, then you don't need consent uh, 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 but they still must um, uh, expect to hear from you, um, which is why even when you don't need consent and send marketing, you still make sure that your privacy notices are contain information about your marketing practices and make it clear um, that uh, people may be contacted um, uh, uh, for these sorts of purposes. So you don't need consent to send a marketing email to a corporate. The, the, the other exception is what's known as the soft opt-in, so if you if you obtain someone's contact details during a sale or negotiations for a sale about a similar product or service um, uh, 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 you, can, you can send information about your similar products or services so long as you give them an opportunity to refuse or to opt out um, when you first collect the information and at every sort of subsequent opportunity so that's one of the reasons why you will see the the unsubscribe link at the bottom of of emails so if for example um uh someone contacted you because they wanted a, a some information and a quote for a a convincing job um that would then the soft opt-in would then entitle you to sort of to to send them information about your your other um uh, uh, the other legal services that you may be able to offer so you, you can add them to your mailing list without getting consent um the um now the rules only apply to to similar services um so 
Uh, but in in my view, if someone say say uh, got in touch about, about a, a property job, um, if you told them about about sort of wills and um, uh, that's that sort of thing, that would still count as a similar service because it's still within the broad umbrella of a legal service. An individual would sort of thing. The individual would would um, um, uh, expect you to tell them about. <clears throat> um, if you can't use uh, 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 soft opt-in uh, and it's, it's not, not a corporate email address then you need to get consent you need to get opt-in gdpr consent um uh, for email uh, in terms of um other, other types of communication um uh you don't uh, uh you, 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 if you're going to call someone for marketing purposes you've got to screen them against the tps the telephone preference service unless they've given you opt-in consent in which case you don't um the rules around uh, personal communications are a bit, are a bit, bit, bit more relaxed. Um, so you don't need consent to send someone marketing by post. However, they still must um, expect to hear from you, which is again why, um, as I mentioned, you should cover this off in your privacy notice. Uh, the definition of marketing is very, very broad. Um, it doesn't just sort of cover um, uh, uh, advertising or telling people about your products and services. Uh, so anything that might sort of promote um, uh, your, your, your aims, your ideals, um, will count as marketing as well. And uh, this is uh, uh, particularly relevant to um, uh, to local authorities. Um, the so, so if you sort of have a newsletter that you, you send out to, you know, to, 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 to everyone, um, uh, uh, if, for example, you talked about the services or sort of, you've got sort of stories in there about sort of trying to encourage or promote uh, recycling, then that probably counts as a marketing communication and, and, and it's one that you will need consent for because the, um, uh, the soft opt-in only applies to marketing uh, products and services. So, so, so it doesn't cover more sort of general uh, uh, types of marketing, for example, um, uh, uh, promoting um, uh, uh, your objectives and your aims, um, uh, uh, e.g., around um, encouraging encouraging recycling. Okay, so <clears throat> I've used the phrase here: the weaponization of data protection, and. What this concerns really is um, the fact that people are ever more using data protection as sort of a as a tool um, in in order to to assist them with sort of um, wider complaints or disputes or to sort of generally cause cause havoc. And this could be anyone, whether it's sort of a a, a member of staff um, who's fishing for information to bring a grievance, or a client that doesn't want to pay pay their bills and um, uh, 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 sort of use the data protection to um, uh, 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 in support of their claim. So as an example of which, so uh, this is a subject, subject access request from someone to the practice. So as dear managing partner, I am so fed up with how your firm has handled my will if you think I'm going to pay your fees, then you've got another thing coming. I'd like to make a full sort of access request for all the information you hold about me. I demand that you send me everything, including a copy of every email and document that names me. I've been a client for 20 years and I want everything. Your investigation and any, do any documents you hold in relation to my previous complaint. Yours sincerely, Mark Smith. So, so possibly what's happening here is, is, is he, uh, poor Mark Smith, he, he, he can't or doesn't want to uh, uh, he's got a gripe, so he's 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 looking, he's making a sort of access request to fish for information to support him in his um, um, uh, 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 fee dispute. So, in terms of how you might approach this, um, clearly to 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 respond um, uh, as he's requested would require a significant amount of work because he claims he's been there in a client for twenty years, and so it might be that you know. That, that the practice holds a lot of information um, um, about him. Um, so if, if you get this sort of uh, request in, if you're, if you're concerned about how much you might hold and the time and effort that it might take to, to pull together everything, 
then one option would be just to ask him for, for clarification. So ask him, for example, if, if his request relates to um, um, uh, uh, specific files or, or specific, um, uh, uh, specific, specific matters. Um, now, it, um, uh, until quite recently, the view of the ICO was that if you ask for clarification, uh, then the, the, the one month period that you have to respond to doesn't begin to run until you receive that clarification. Um, but very unhelpfully for organisations, the ICO changed their view and their view now is that if you see clarification, the clock continues to run. Um, so, so if you haven't seen clarification, uh, obviously it needs to be done, um, it needs to be done promptly. Um, in terms of, of, of um, uh, responses generally in timings, uh, as I mentioned, you have about a month to respond, but you are entitled to up to a further two months, so three months in total, if the request is complex. And um, uh, in, in my experience, the, the, the ICO tend to be quite relaxed um, uh, uh, if an organisation claims that it's complex and therefore they, they need more time. Um, uh, uh, the ICO don't generally sort of um, um, question that too much in my experience. Um, so if you, if, you, you know, if, you, if you did want longer and if you have a good reason, then, 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 then you can probably, um, uh, uh, you probably get longer. Um, in addition, the, uh, the ICO uh, at the start of COVID uh, produced a, um, uh, uh, a document outlining its approach to data protection and compliance during COVID. And they made it very clear in that document that they want to be a, a, a sensible and pragmatic regulator. And they're not, for example, going to enforce, um, uh, they're, not, they're unlikely, unlikely, unlikely to take enforcement action um, if an organization doesn't meet the, the, the usual one month period, um, a, a response period, if they can't do so because of, um, uh, because of COVID, because if, if, if staff are furloughed or they can't access documents, et cetera. Um, so, so, so the upshot is, if you need longer than one month, then, 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 then that's, in many cases, that would be that, that would be okay. The other point to note here is he's requested a copy of every email and, and document that, that names him. Um, under an SIR, an individual is entitled to their personal data rather than to documents. So, so, so it is perfectly lawful um, to extract the personal data. Uh, from documents and say disclose that information to uh, uh, to the requester in a separate document and sometimes that can be a, a sensible thing to do so if for example you have a document and you only want to disclose a small proportion uh, of a document rather than giving them something that's got lots of redactions in um, uh, you can just extract what's this personal data into say a word document and disclose that instead the, the other um the other point is this the um uh, if you again, it's it's about providing him with his personal data. So it could well be that many documents um, uh, uh, don't contain any personal data other than his name and the fact that he's a client. Um, in which case, those would need to be disclosed because it's simply duplicating uh, uh, the information that he's already uh, going to be uh, provided with. He's also requested your investigation and any documents that you hold in relation to my previous complaint. And, and it, it seems probable that at least some of that would um, uh, uh, within his, his personal data. Um, however, it may be that all he would get would have been much more than, than the information he's, he's already been given, i.e. The, the fact that he made a complaint and the outcome of that complaint. So if, for example, um, uh, there are sort of documents in the file that, that concern, um, say, the conduct of the member of staff, um, uh, lessons learned from the member of staff, further training, or, or information about um, how the practice should, should sort of um, uh, improve things for future, then none of, that, none of that is his personal data. And, and, and those sorts of information just, just wouldn't usually be, be disclosable. So individuals are generally only entitled to a copy um, to their own personal data. Uh, they can't usually make an SAR to get information about, about someone else. Um, but where it gets but a particular flashpoint is, is where you've got mixed data. So if you have a document or an email, that's both about the requester and about a third party, then, then 
then that's where it gets interesting. So here we have a, an, an internal email uh, from someone to a colleague. Uh, it says, um, I'm so fed up with Mark Smith. Uh, all he ever does is complain about the quality of the job we've done for him. He started asking me about my qualifications and experience each time we speak, insinuating that I can't do my job. He's starting to make me feel really anxious every time the phone goes. He's just emailed asking for a call tomorrow. Would you mind taking it instead? Sorry, I know you are very busy as well. So do you think that would be disclosable in response to Mark Smith's sort of, sort of access request? So what the Data Protection Act says is, is in this sort of situation where you have mixed personal data, you've essentially got to balance up the, uh, the requester's rights against the rights of the other individuals identifiable from the information. Um, so, uh, uh, and you should only disclose if the other party has consented or it's, or, or it's reasonable to disclose in the absence of that consent. And if, if we look at what's happening here, this is clearly um, uh, an employee who's sort of suffering a bit. Um, she, she meant, uh, he or she mentions that, Brian mentions that, he's feeling really, really anxious uh, every time the phone goes. Um, um, so the focus of, of a lot of this is on Brian rather than on Mark Smith. And in particular, the references to Brian's mental health are, are, are really quite personal to, um, 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 to Brian. So I would certainly suggest as a starting point that this, um, that this, shouldn't, be, uh, uh, that this shouldn't be shared with Mark Smith. Now, it may be that some of the information contained um, is disclosable. For example, the second sentence, all he ever does is complain about the quality of the job we've done for him. Now, if, if, if lots of staff have, for example, made that comment about Mark Smith, then it might be that that comment is disclosed as long as it can't sort of be, 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 um, be traced back to Brian as, as the source, as the source of that comment in, in, order, to protect, in, in order to protect Brian. Um, just thinking uh, tactically as well uh, with these sorts of things. If um, um, if this is withheld and it turns out that was the wrong decision, then then Mark Smith still has the right to complain to the Information Commissioner, and the Information Commissioner would either say yes, it, it was. Um, if it looked into it, he'd either say it, it, it was fine to withhold this, or or, or it may sort of request that some of the information be be disclosed. Um, the uh, and that's really it. The the the, the ICO you know, they're, they're very likely to take enforcement action, um, uh, 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 in these sorts of cases where, where, where it's a marginal call, and you can see sort of arguments either way. If, on the other hand, this email is, is shared and and uh, uh, and it turns out that wasn't right, then you know the the um, uh, the cancer, the it, it's too late. You know you, you can't put it back in the box. It it, it it's already been shared. And so for that reason, sometimes a, a cautious approach um, um, is, um, uh, uh, can be considered preferable. Okay, so another, um, another problem area is around data breaches. And um, we're finding that we're, we're advising on more and more data breaches uh, since lockdown, I guess, as people are sort of working in a different environment um, uh, they might sort of have additional pressures um, um, uh, and so sort of perhaps are more sus uh, susceptible to, um, uh, to mistakes. So I've got an example of a personal data breach here. So this says, Dear Head of Compliance, I've just found out that I accidentally sent a spreadsheet containing client data to the wrong person. I meant to send it to our developers so that they could upload it to our new CRM system. It relates to about 200 clients. Whether I sent it to a neighbour by mistake. But he also says that he knows some of the people mentioned in the spreadsheet and has already told them what it says. He has just emailed to say that he is going to send it to a friend who works for the Bristol Post unless we pay him compensation for distress. Help. So where would you where would you start with this? Um, so Obviously, being a data protection lawyer, the first question that springs to mind is, does this need to be reported uh, to the ICO, to the Information Commissioner? So the obligation is to report a data breach unless it is unlikely to result in a risk to individuals. And it, it seems to me, but based on the, the, the number of people affected and the fact that the, uh, uh, 
the neighbour, the unintended recipient, has already said he's shared it, and I'm threatened, threatened to share it further, then yes, this would probably trigger a, um, 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 an obligation um, to reports uh, to the ICO. Um, in terms of sort of um, uh, uh, additional steps, um, you would also, there's, there's clearly a risk of a claim here, so you should be sort of, um, if this happens to you, you should be notifying your insurers um, about what's happened and also just, just sort of running any correspondence past your insurers, so make sure that um, uh, um, they see any draft report to the ICO before, um, uh, before it goes. Um, but, but perhaps a more pressing issue is, is the, the risk of harm to the 200 clients and what's going to happen to their data. And the um, uh, and the steps that you, you might you, you might want to take here. Um, now, the obligation the obligation is to tell the ICO if the breach unless the breach is unlikely to result in a risk. You only have to tell individuals if what's happened represents a high risk to them. So it's it's a higher threshold. But I think there is a you know there is a good case here that that the the high risk threshold has been met in, in relation to these clients. And that they need to be told, um, um, uh, and there may also be sort of SRA requirements there as well, in addition to 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 what's required under data protection law. Now, in terms of um, um, what you would do with a neighbour, um, he's um, uh, uh, you know, clearly this would be a huge concern because he's he's um, he says he's already shared some of the information. Uh, he's he's gone to the he's. Um, threatening to go to, to the local paper, um, he's, he's probably committed a, a, a criminal offence um, by, by, by sharing the information as he's done. Um, so, so, so pretty prompt action will need to be taken against him um, in order to sort of help contain the breach and, 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 and to manage what's happened. Um, now, that might be um, uh, sort of writing to him urgently or, or contacting him, getting him to confirm that he will delete the, the information and, and he won't share it further. Um, and perhaps get him to sign an undertaking to that effect. Um, but uh, another option, to, the nuclear, nuclear option, would be to get a, an injunction uh, to, to prevent him from sharing it. But obviously that's going to be hugely expensive and, and um, uh, uh, you, know, so you have to take a view on, on, on whether that would be uh, uh, proportionate in this, in this particular case. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's it's not immediately obvious from this um, what's happened. The I think it's a uh, it's a concern that the uh, that the spreadsheet uh, uh, that this employee managed to send the spreadsheet to a neighbour. So does that suggest, for example, um, that the um, uh, uh, that they're using their they're using their personal email account um, uh, uh, to send out the spreadsheet? Um, so that really needs some investigation. Um, uh, why are they sending the information to the development spreadsheet? That there are more secure and, and far more effective ways to sort of you know to 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 transfer confidential personal data. Um, uh, and, and those are also the sorts of points that the ICO will take a look at when deciding what, um, uh, if any, um, enforcement action to take. Okay, so that was everything that I wanted to, to cover off. Um, uh, Helen, is it now is it now time for, for questions? Absolutely. Uh, right. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, so at the moment, um, please do um, put any questions that you have in. I think we've got a bit of time for you to pop those in there. Question from me. Um, I'm just kind of aware that, you know, talking about marketing and business development and people being at home a great deal more, I'm guessing that potentially platforms such as LinkedIn might be being used a little bit more. And I appreciate this might be straying slightly into employment areas as well, but to what extent is the information that you have on LinkedIn your personal information or does it belong to the company? Because I've been asked that a couple of times recently. Um, so it's, it's, it's personal data. Um, uh, uh, in the sense that it's it, it's information about the the, the, the individuals, um, but it, it is a um, uh, to what extent the uh, that data is either owned by the employee or, or by the business um, uh, uh, is a a 
a sort of a battle that hasn't yet sort of been 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 properly fought. Um, the uh, lots of sort of um, uh, uh, employment contracts now make it uh, uh, trying to sort of purport to give the employer ownership of someone's LinkedIn profile. So, so they are required, for example, to to if the, if the employee leaves, they are required, for example, to delete um, uh, uh, their LinkedIn contacts before they um, um, uh, before they leave the um, uh, the firm. Um, so it's it's it, it, it's going to be a battleground. But but um, as to as to sort of um, uh, whether it's probably the employee's data or, or the um, uh, 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 employers, I'm I'm not aware that that's sort of been tested in court yet. Interesting. And I suppose, I guess, if you're developing new relationships on something like LinkedIn, it'd be sensible if you've got a client relationship management system to transfer that data into onto that system, isn't it? And then it becomes clearer, I guess. Absolutely. Ultimately. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the other question that I had was um, to what extent, you know, given particularly with the home working and the fact that obviously, you know, lockdown came very quickly and, you know, lots of some particularly larger organisations perhaps were better set up, you know, with people already agile working or remote working. To what extent do you think if there have been some breaches of data protection, um, you know, how lenient or otherwise do you think the ICO are likely to be in those sort of circumstances? Well, people, you know, I appreciate as time goes on, less lenient because it's kind of, it has become a new normal, hasn't it? But if anything occurred in those early days, is there any sense from them that they, they too might have been taken by surprise by what has happened in the in the last few months. Absolutely. Um, the um, I would expect the ICO would be more lenient um, if if a breach that happened early days was reported to them. Um, so so they'd be less 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 likely to take enforcement action, for example. Um, uh, but, but but as you say, Helen, as time moves on and this becomes the new normal, um, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be much more. Um, uh, um, they're, going to, they're going to be sort of less willing uh, to give organisations leeway. And um, uh, I'm just looking at um, what's coming in. Um, I mean, during this period, have you have you seen a a rise in particular issues that sort of concern to people? Um, yes. So uh, as I mentioned, um, so so what we um, um, when all this happened when when lockdown happened we, we, we were very very busy with giving um advice around um home working and what you need to do to make that data protection compliant um uh then then it, it's um uh, but so, so, something like what we've, we've seen two things first um there have been more data breaches and they they it seems to fall into two categories um either uh someone making a mistake uh so an, an employee sort of Send an email to 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 the wrong recipient, and we're also seeing um, uh, 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 more organisations having been having been the victim of, of of hacks. So 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 it seems that that sort of um, the lockdown has encouraged um, um, people to um, uh, uh, cyber criminals to, to to try their luck. Um, so so yes, there's, there's definitely been a um, uh, uh, definitely been a, a a change in that. Uh, and we've seen those things, but we're, we're also seeing, uh, we're also getting a, a uh, seeing an increased number of cyber access requests. So, so people are requesting their data, perhaps in the context of them having been um, uh, uh, made redundant, or whether they've got, or whether they're sort of uncertain about um, uh, their future work prospects. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, interesting times, and and. Don't appear to have any more questions coming in. So just a couple of more minutes. If anybody else wants to chuck in a question, please let me know. But I mean, in terms of you know people leaving this webinar today, if, if you know if you're an employer or if you're an, an individual working from home, you know what are the top couple of things you'd say? Right, go go and go and just double check now. It's... Right, I don't think we've got any more questions. So, any any final comments, Andrew, on things that people might want to just double check as as, as they leave this webinar, keep themselves think, safe. <laughs> yes, no, I think as I mentioned, information security is is is, is the thing that carries the most risk on data protection compliance. So, just make sure that you that from working from home, you've got the, sort of the right kit in place, you've got all the policies and procedures, 
and that staff know um, uh, uh, having given guidance on, 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 on homeworking and the do's and don'ts. Wonderful. Right, well, I, th I think that's it. But um, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I really appreciate that. That's got a quite a, a wide ranging um, uh, view of the issues that are kind of, um, that are facing lots of firms at the moment. And I'm really grateful um, for your, um, your thoughts on, on that. As said before, um, for those of you who um, didn't hear me to begin with, we're going to send um, Andrew's um, slides uh, and also an edited recording of this without my bloopers at the beginning when I didn't realise I was being recorded. Apologies to everybody. Um.